So you probably looked at this session and you're kind of like, well, what is socio-technical modeling, right? Anybody like, what is this? Yeah, kind of strange. And I think for some of you that may know of me in my past, you know, you know that one of the topics that I <clears throat> often talk about quite often is legacy code. And this has nothing to do with that at all, right? This is really something I've been investigating for a while. And it's really what it's about. It's about basically going and seeing the forces that are within development situations and trying to go and basically navigate them in order to go and make better decisions about how we organize ourselves and what our processes will be and um, how, we, how we do the things that kind of connect with our code and things along these lines. Um, so, I don't know, I guess the main thing I can say is that, you know, even with its title, socio-technical modeling as a practice, not really going to talk about it as a practice all that much. What we're really going to do is we're going to dig into socio-technical forces. I'm going to go and outline a number of them and show you how they manifest in particular situations in software development and hopefully give you a different frame for going and understanding things that happen in development systems. Um, and I really want to go and carry this stuff forward over time into like a, a better model of these things because, I don't know, how many people have heard of like the Spotify model, right? Right, exactly. And the thing is, when you talk to the people that were involved in the creation of this, they always say it's like, this is not the thing that you should do. This is what we did and it worked for us, right? And there's this phrase that people use sometimes, like use... Um, Cargo culting, it's like this thing where you basically say, okay, well, it worked for them, so let's go ahead and do it over here. And I think that's really the state that we have right now within the industry when it comes to organization and practice and process. We basically find something that worked really good in one situation, then we say, hey, that worked, good chance that we can go and use it over here. So we try it out, maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. I think we can actually start to put some like theoretical underpinnings a lot of, around a lot of these things that help us go in and... Um, arrive at like a, a method for going and actually sort of making various different decisions about how we organize ourselves. So let's go and dig into this a little bit. I want to start out with this one slide here. Okay, isomorphism. Has anybody ever heard of this word before, isomorphism? Okay, yeah, now if you have like a mathematical background and you took much math in school, you probably came across this particular word, which basically means you can draw a correspondence between two things that have roughly the same structure, almost exactly the same structure. And it's, you know, strange. You'll see this in graph theory. You'll see things that look kind of different when you look at the way that they're connected. Even though the shape is kind of different, the connections are all the same. And this goes and tells you something quite important. Graph theory is almost like the language of connection, okay, within mathematics. And when you can see how things are connected, you can see how things can be transmuted from one node to another. And, um, you know, think about any social graph, right? You basically go and think about you and all your friends. You know that friend A and friend B never talk to each other, but they both talk to friend C. That tells you something about the connections within that group, that social group. So I'm not going to go and basically get deep into math, thank goodness, right? But I do want to go and point out that this thing, this way of going and looking at things as if they are graphs, is pretty powerful for us as we go and make decisions in teams and organizations. Anybody know what this is at all? Huh? It's a graph. Yay, okay. You know, we have somebody a wise acre here, right? Um, you know, I guess the thing I'm going to ask is like, uh, you know, even more directly, are these microservices or teams? What's the difference? You know, you'd kind of think that maybe there wouldn't be much difference, but in many organizations, the, the, the graphs can be wildly different. And the thing is with this, I can't even go in, I'm not even going to tell you whether these are microservices or teams. Um, would you be surprised in either case if the graph looked like this? It's a funny thing with this. Essentially, there are things about graph theory and the dynamics of systems in the world that basically go ahead and cause certain patterns to reoccur in many different realms. And it's kind of neat because once you understand those things, then you have a chance of going and saying, well, if I see this pattern over here, it could mean something because I've seen that pattern in other realms, other domains. So let's go ahead and look at this stuff in the context of like a, a problem, a thing which actually I ran into years ago working with a couple of teams. Um, there was an organization, they had like five teams or so, and they were kind of told that they have to go and do some automated testing, right? Because automated testing is good. So the thing is, the particular domain that they were working in, there was nothing really like off the shelf, no open source testing framework they could use very easily. So what each team did is start to go and create their own solution because they just needed to go and do the work, right? So as they were doing this, they kind of got to the point where they started to notice that, well, we're kind of duplicating effort a bit, so why don't we go ahead and sort of take some of the best of the stuff that we have in each of the teams and kind of put it in the center, make like this testing app or testing framework that everybody can kind of like use in order to go and do the things they need to do. This makes sense? Yeah, it seems like a reasonable decision to make on development, um, in a development organization. 
But the thing about this, though, is that essentially the code in the center started to get a little bit weird. And they didn't really notice it right away. But the big thing about this was there was no team associated with this code at all. So it's kind of like you have people coming and working on this a little bit, and then kind of going away, coming and working, and then going away. Do you anticipate that this worked out well? Yeah, yeah. And the thing is, I, that's the thing that's really funny. I've heard a number of people say, oh, no, it probably doesn't work out all that well. But I think anybody that's had any time in the industry who spent like maybe five, ten years, you start to develop this intuition about when something is a little bit off, and then you're like, okay, well, we need to fix something like this. And if you're lucky, you see it early enough to go and actually do the things it takes to go make things a bit better. Um, with this team, though, it wasn't quite that good. I actually found out, that, out about this situation just by looking at the code that was in the center, that testing framework. And what I saw was this. I saw this giant base class that had all these methods, and it's kind of like, there weren't exactly comments in here saying team zero stuff, team one stuff, team two stuff, but it's pretty close to that. Essentially, you saw all these things that people kind of hacked into this base class because they didn't really quite want to go and take the time to go and actually make this into a nice framework. They just needed to get their job done, so they threw things in there. So, yeah, kind of a funny thing. Um, not an ideal situation, I would suppose, right? So here's the thing. If we have this particular problem, how do we solve this problem? Infrastructure team, any other ideas? Sorry? Ownership, yeah, having ownership of that code and stuff like that. I want to step back for a second and say, let's not worry about how to solve the problem right away. Let's go and understand what the forces are behind these things. Um, and, you know, one of the forces is Conway's Law, right? This is my favorite slide in the world about Conway's Law. Have you all heard about Conway's Law? Yeah, okay, and most of you have, a lot of you. Some people aren't raising their hands at all, and it's kind of a shame because it's really very important. Um, some of these are a little bit dated, but these are kind of like pictures of organizations and what you might assume that they are organized like based upon their behavior, right? So back in the, um, you know, back in the, uh, you know, the days when Steve Jobs was at the center of Apple, it was really all like he was in the center and basically everybody went to him directly. No real intermediaries. He basically would walk in the office and say, this is the way we're doing things. Um, Facebook, you can imagine being highly networked. Amazon, you've got Bezos at the top with all this federated structure, right? And that's what we can anticipate things look like inside there. Um, Google, it's kind of interesting. It's like you can imagine they have their leadership, but heavily, heavily networked and inter-networked at the very base of it. And that's my sense of what they do internally like this. This is really all stuff that kind of points to this, Mel Conway's law, right? And he basically came up with this observation many, many years ago. And he made the point that um, when you are looking at structure, okay, in the wild, um, one of the things you can kind of like guess is that the team structure ended up going in producing the structure that you're looking at, right? Team structure ends up going in mirroring itself in the structures that we create. And if you haven't run into this before, it's really something which is worth digging into. He had a rough time of this when he first put it out in the industry because nobody quite believed him or they, they wouldn't even publish his work because they felt like there's no research around this. But since then, Many research institutions have like experimentally verified this and shown case studies that show that this happens. Anybody know why that happens, Conway's Law? It's funny, it looks like it might be a mystery of the universe, but it isn't really. If we have several teams of people, it's easier to talk to the people on your own team than to talk to the people on the other team. So rather than getting into the nuts and bolts of what they're working on, better to have an interface and software between you. So the componentization tends to go mirror the boundaries that you have in the organization. So Conway's Law is really an interesting and valuable thing. Um, and it basically points to this like, deep thing that code and team structure are somewhat isomorphic. Um, but here's the thing. I'm sure many of you are familiar with Conway's Law, but what other forces are there? Let's talk about a couple more. Um, anybody familiar with Pareto's Law? Okay, or power law distributions? Scale-free networks? They're all kind of the same. You know, like Pareto's Law is basically like... Um, if you're in an organization, the, uh, the last 20% takes 80% of the effort. Have you heard of this at all? And it seems like a bit of a joke, but you know, if you're working on a tight deadline with something, you probably see that all the time, right? Um, but Pareto's Law is just this thing, it's this shape, where essentially you see this pattern occur in all sorts of natural systems, and all sorts of human systems as well. Um, here's one where you basically have earnings by golfer, you know, people that golf, and you basically find there are very, very few people, or no, there are... Um, yeah, very, very few people that basically have a certain income in um, golfing. And then lots and lots of people off to the right that have lower income with us. And that's not just golfing, that's just income in general. That basically whenever you have something where you have a bit of 
competition and people are able to go and actually sort of make a preference in their choice in having this kind of structure. This is also like if you're on Twitter, Twitter followers. You know, there are some people that have millions and millions of followers, but not too many of them. And then there are lots and lots of people that have smaller numbers of followers. Now, you know, you'll see this as well in other places. You'll see this in network, um, in the network of airline hubs, yeah, which is kind of fascinating. Some airports have lots and lots and lots of connections, and others have just a few, right? And there's a small number of ones that have lots and lots and lots of connections. And what that's about, really, is that it's easier for us to, if we're choosing to decide where to fly our airplanes as an airline, we want to go and actually connect with the bigger hubs because that gives all of our clients more, more, uh, you know, more possibility. They can go more places. So that some of these are almost like attractors. People want to go and actually connect to Atlanta or to Heathrow and stuff like this. Now you might say, okay, this is kind of interesting that it goes and shows up in many different places. What does this mean for us in software? Um, well, you know, in software, one of the things that's interesting is that method size follows the power law distribution, which is kind of weird, right? If you look at all the methods in your code base, you'll discover that there are, you know, tons and tons and tons of one and two line methods, but then quite very much fewer hundred line, thousand line methods, right? And you might be saying to yourself, oh no, he hasn't seen my code base. I have tons of thousand line methods. But the deal is, you know, even if that's true, the shape, the thing we have on the left hand side is the same probably just different coefficients to the curve, right? So that happens in many different places. What about in the social realm? Okay, well, before we get to that, let's talk about this other thing, too. Um, this thing about going and having methods, having, like, uh, a particular shape to the distribution that we have of methods, it's kind of fascinating because I remember going to some team a long time ago, and they had this thing where... Um, they, I looked at their code and it seemed like it didn't quite make much sense. I'm looking at the methods that they have and the names were not matching the names of the, the bodies of the methods. Things weren't really aligning very well. And when you see stuff like this, you start thinking, well, what's wrong with the way that these people think? And that's rough because we tend to think we should be able to think pretty well for developers, right? So it was really a, big, a bit of a mystery until I wandered around the room and started discovering that, um, that what was going on was that essentially they had some hard and fast rule. They basically said that once methods get to a certain size, I think it was like 15 lines, they should basically just sort of like make sure they never go any higher. So what they did is they actually chopped down the methods to smaller pieces. And you can imagine that the names would not match the bodies of the methods all that well. But the funny thing about this though is that anybody who knows like um, signal processing, you ever see like a sine curve? Like if you have like a trumpet or a flute, it has like a nice smooth curve like this. This is what distortion looks like. Distortion is when you clip the top and the bottom of the curve. So when you hear that buzzing sound, zzz, that's what distortion is. So this thing of having hard rules against what should be the natural shape of the code base is really distortion. And it's a way of going and thinking about things. So the next time you have an idea of having like a hard rule about things, ugh, think about it, right? So what that means for us is we can really anticipate having in code bases some very large methods mainly because we don't know what to do with them yet, and then have lots of small methods, and that's okay. What you really want to do is have like way more of those smaller methods than the ones that are large. So that's another place where having like an insight into power law distributions can help us out. Um, what about this? Might be hard to see the connection, but what do you think about having heroes on your team? It's kind of funny. At least in the U.S. and some other places, there's this notion that the person who's trying to do everything on the team is the person who's kind of toxic. That they essentially are the person that you want to say, look, share the work more equally and all these different things because otherwise we get ourselves into a bit of trouble and there's always like this assumption that the person is being very difficult and they're trying to, you know, uh, exclude people in ways. But there's an interesting thing about this. I saw a paper that came out this past April and it was this and it was using this term hero, which basically was kind of, um, it did make people upset when they first saw the paper. But the fascinating thing that they were kind of realizing was that this Pareto distribution tends to happen in teams also. And what I mean by this is that essentially when you look at all these GitHub repositories and do analysis, you discover that basically 80% of the work is done by 20% of the people on the team. Okay? And that's not just the work in terms of the number of commits, it's also all the conversation around the pull requests and various different things. If you look at contribution on teams, you'll see it's like an 80-20 thing. Um, and it's actually kind of 
you know, worse than that in a way, the 20% of people that go and contribute like 80% of the work, their contributions are higher quality also. Now, is this one of those things where you look at it and you're kind of like, oh, this is terrible. These people are kind of like pushing people aside to go and make all these contributions and we should stop them. Is that a thing that we should do? Um, it's kind of funny. There's, without going and getting into this frame of like people are being mean, there's another very natural reason why this might occur. And the natural reason is that there is like a benefit to getting to know something. As you get to know it, then you become the person who is most likely to be able to produce a better contribution in that area. So it's very easy to see as a natural process why this sort of thing happens on teams. And then you might say, well, then what does that mean for us? Um, you know, the, I think the main thing that it really kind of means is that maybe smaller teams are better, right? If you have fewer people that are contributing at a high rate, then that's better because as you start to add more and more people, you start to get some diminishing returns. You don't start to go and get quite as much benefit. So this is a thing which is still, I guess, kind of being sorted out in the industry, but it's not, it's not really a thing which is, we shouldn't see it as being um, something which is really new. Have you ever heard of like the, um, Amazon has the notion of like a two pizza team? Have you heard about this at all? Right, okay. So we know that in general, smaller groups of people tend to work better together, and it's because we have for n people, you have n squared connections, and you know you want to keep n squared kind of low as you're going and trying to go and you know form, uh, deal with communication on a team. So this is one of those natural forces that we have in software developers. That smaller teams tend to be better. We should probably be reluctant about growing teams out when we can. So this is the thing: cognitive limits constrain structure, and um, you know there are other places that we see this. Dunbar's number. Have you heard about this at all? So an anthropologist. Um, Sociologist Robin Dunbar made this observation years ago that once you get past 100 people, okay, in an organization, then you get to the point where you can't recognize people by sight much anymore or connect a name with their faces. And then as a result, it's like his hypothesis was that once organizations grow to be about 100 people, then you're in the situation where maybe you need to go and change your organizational structure because otherwise the old ways of relating are not going to work and you need to find new ways of relating. Okay? So you kind of see with these forces, we can sort of like use these to go make trade-offs when we decide what our organization is going to be like, right? Here's a funny one, okay, and this is kind of strange. I only discovered this a couple of years ago, but um, anybody here of Galileo, right? He had lots of trouble with the church, okay, several centuries ago. And um, of course, he was thrown into prison and, uh, you know, quite the bad guy at the time. But when you're in prison and you're very, very smart, what do you do? Well, you think of problems to solve. And one of the things that he recognized was that there's a reason why mouse, mice and elephants look very different. Okay? And you might say, well, evolution. That's why they look very, very different. But you will never have a mouse that's the size of an elephant. And the th reason why, as he said this, was that the structure of a mouse will not work at the scale of an elephant. And the reason why is for this is that when you have a physical structure, its volume grows as the cube of a base unit. And um, the surface area grows as the square of the base unit. Okay, so there's like this tendency with this thing so that basically as the volume grows more and more, you need either stronger structure, um, stronger surface area, or you need more surface area in order to go and actually piece things together. And this is true of buildings as well. Essentially the structure that you have for us, a house, simply will not work at the scales of a modern skyscraper. It just doesn't work at all. Now, you might be wondering why I'm mentioning this, but I think it's because there's this key thing of going and recognizing that as we scale things, you can expect to do things differently. And a lot of times we don't really internalize that all that much about the things that we do. For instance, agile software development started as a process of going and having like about six people work together, go and develop software for one person in an organization. And what are we doing now with agile? So much of it is all about how do we scale this thing, right? I remember myself having the intuition early on that it's like maybe we can't scale this thing because structure changes this way. But the thing is, we can try to do something which is like it, and then we basically put all these props in place in order to go and basically deal with these issues. But this thing of scaling being, scaling forcing change in structure is pretty powerful. And you can see this in the context of all of your software architecture as well. It's just the truth of the way things are organized. Um, another thing as well, when we look at communication on teams, you know, one of the things that's funny is noticing cliques, right? So you ever see this at all, like, um, you know, 
you have a group of like 10, 12 people, and then there's some people on, in that group that talk to each other more than they talk to everybody else. Ever see that happen at all? Yeah, and that happens. What are the chances of having cliques on a team that's like three people? There's no room for a clique, it's just the team is the clique, right? Yeah. So the thing is, as things grow, and I think it has to do with the cost of communication, we get into this state where basically we break up and we subdivide into smaller units, smaller groups of people. And um, it's funny about this, that we have this differentiation of structure as things grow. Um, is this true of software also? Yeah, it is. I mean, you can't look at a big class, right? And this is a relatively small big class, without noticing that as it grows, you're going to have separation of internal structure also. And you've heard of the single responsibility principle? Yeah, so the same kind of thing is going on with this. Anytime you have 10 or 12 methods, chances are you can look at those methods and find sub, sub, some subgroupings, which basically go ahead and align in particular ways. And um, you, know, they, you could go and choose to go and break those things off into you know, uh, separate classes or not, but just basically know that that's a tendency with things. And this is true of teams also. You know, I've seen people try having 20-person teams, and that's like well below Dunbar's number. But then as people start to break off into smaller units and to keep costs of communication low, we tend to break ourselves off into smaller units as well. But it's kind of valuable to see this as being something which is common across all these realms. You see this in biology also, right? Cells divide, you know, and essentially it's kind of like... Um, there's this thing where basically as the cell grows, it goes and differentiates an internal structure. I guess the thing I'm pointing out is that these are not just things that we invent. These are natural phenomena. And you'll see them in biology, you'll see them in physical structure. You know, you'll basically go and see them in teams. You see them in architecture. It's not a mistake that we see these things in architecture. It's just that, you know, it's what we have to do to basically deal with these natural forces. So all these things kind of tie together into a nice thing. Um, as I mentioned earlier, single responsibility principle falls apart as we scale, and you can look at single responsibility even in terms of like team things too. That as you have a group of people grow, um, as it takes on more responsibilities, things start to get a bit weird. Okay, so the cost of modularity is explicit complexity. We we can't just take something and grow it, grow it, grow it without producing structure. Then we produce that structure, and that structure is like the way that the pieces interact, and that's modularity. And then when we're doing this. It causes you know, additional complexity. So some complexity is intrinsic to scale for us. Here's another interesting thing. Component teams and feature teams. Has anybody worked with component teams and feature teams at all? Yeah, it's interesting. And now we move, we've moved way more towards product teams, which is really a better, you know, uh, a better way of organizing things. But I still see the feature team pattern in many places. Um, you know, the originally with software development, what we would do is, I guess sort of because of Conway's law, we would set things up so that, well, we break things into pieces, and we have teams working on each piece, and each piece is a functional area of the code base, right? This is kind of like the database access layer, this is the front end, and all these things. Then you'd have, you know, well, hell, we still do this, right? You have front end developers and you have back end developers. Do they work together very much? You kind of hope, but quite often they're seen as separate specialties, right? So we have separate areas of the code base that are basically staffed by different people. and. Um, those are the different components that we basically have within the organization. The problem with component teams that was basically recognized many years ago was that when you do this, it's kind of like you may not have enough work for every component team during, say, a sprint, for instance. And because of this, you know, it's like some people will just have nothing to do in one particular sprint except refactor and try to make things better, and that's good. So the idea then was to basically go ahead and do feature teams, which is to go and say, let's create certain long-lived teams that are empowered to basically go ahead and go any place in the code base, make the changes they need to make in order to go and just sort of like satisfy those features, get those features done. And I remember when I first heard this, I thought, something kind of strange about this. It might be something which doesn't quite work out that well. And I've seen it kind of go bad in some places and seen it go good in some places. But the idea with the, the thing with the feature teams that is kind of rough is that if you don't really have the ownership, then you're in this place where Maybe it's hard to find somebody that knows this code as well as the person who wrote it. And if it's hard, then you, know, you may not be able to find that person. You just basically make your change, and you've lost the context. You don't have the full context of all, everything that we've known about this thing as we were developing it. And um, without that context, it's kind of hard to see things going well. Right? So one way that this has been kind of like addressed is to go and say, let's have like a component um, 
uh, custodian or component guardian, who basically is the person who will basically review the pull requests um, when you know they come in and basically like you know I know this area better than anybody else does, so I'm going to go and review these things and make sure that everything aligns with what needs to be done in that particular area. But doesn't it feel like you know we introduced something to solve a problem, but now we're introducing something else to solve the problem introduced by the original thing, right? Isn't that kind of a funny thing? When we get into that, it's, um, it's really kind of an odd thing to think about. Um, I'll say more about that a little bit later. Uh, the thing that we were talking about a little bit earlier, having smaller and smaller teams. Um, one of the things that I think is kind of interesting to think about there is that imagine that for all the things that we have, we have the team, we have the tools that we're working with, and we have the code, that um, it seems like we don't want to overload too much on these things. That there's limits to what we can really kind of understand. If you take one person and give them a 10 million line code base, what are the chances that they'll understand that system thoroughly? Very, very low, right? Um, if you basically have like a 10,000 line code base, which is you know, pretty small, and you give 100 teams that task of going and working on that, it's kind of ridiculous also because, you know, there'll be all this communication among those hundred people. They'll be lost in meetings, you know, trying to understand how to coordinate their work. So too many people and not enough code is kind of rough. Um, too much code and not enough people is kind of rough. There's also the thing, too, that you can be swamped by going and using 30 or 40 different tools. And then basically all the interactions of those tools or frameworks end up being very difficult to go and understand. So I almost feel like there's this sweet spot for us cognitively, where if you almost have a scaling factor on the number of people in a team, the number of tools, the amount of code, um, it should all be less than some constant. And you know, we would just apply a scaling factor to these things. And this really has to do with the cognitive load. How many more people can you interact with? And how many tools can you work with? And how much code can you basically understand you know, as you're going and doing these things? You know, there was a lot of stuff a while back going and saying that that old rule, seven plus or minus two, the number of things you can keep in short-term memory, isn't quite true all the time. And there's exceptions to it and stuff like this. But I think we all kind of recognize that there are limits to how much we can really understand all at once, right? So, you know, the extreme thing is to go and say, one person works on a small amount of code with only one tool. And then we're like a cyborg, right? Does it make sense? Could we do this? Yeah, we could. It's kind of extreme, though. But the thing is, what I want you to do is basically be aware of the force involved in this. Be aware of the fact that we have these things that kind of keep things a bit small. Um, Interesting blog by a guy named Ben Rady that was written a couple years ago, and it was kind of interesting because he was talking about he worked on a small product inside of a company, two developers, they would come in every day, they would pair on everything as they were doing, and they basically wrote the test themselves, they actually supported it in production, and their customer was in the room, and they didn't have a backlog at all. And um, they just really, they would just sort of like come in, figure out what to do, work on it, and go home at the end of the day, and trade off production support between the two of them. And they said it was amazing to discover how little you can get away with in terms of process when your team is very, very small, right? So there is this thing that this dynamic of keeping things smaller goes and has these incredible benefits. So then what can we do, right? Because our code tends to scale out, our products tend to scale out. Um, we have to think more about, you know, maybe the answer is to go and try to go and sort of modularize things in such a way that we can have just two-person teams, for instance. It's kind of a funny thing. Um, Anybody ever hear of The Mythical Man Month by Fred Brooks? A okay, great book, right? One of the things that came to mind when I first started like, investigating this a bit is um, Harlan Mills, who was mentioned in that book. He had this idea a long time ago, decades ago, called the Chief Surgeon Programmer Team. And his idea was like just complete role separation and having a small team to do a project. He said, well, it's kind of true that we can recognize that some people are just way, way better at working with code than others are. So why don't we have like one person who writes all the code and an assistant that helps that person out and then have someone who basically is like uh, aware of all the tools being used and can help with the tools and another person does, writes all the tests. Now this seems like a very archaic old way of doing things now that would never fly today. But one of the things that I think is kind of fascinating is that, well, let me put it this way. I talked to some people from a, you know, a, one of the big corporations that you probably know that said that they use two-person teams on their projects. And... Um, we started going and lamenting over dinner about how we want to basically have like architectural decision records, record all the choices we made so that we can have a project history. But then you've only got two people, so it's kind of like rough to go and sort of record all this stuff. And I thought, well, maybe you can add people to the team, but maybe they don't have to be developers. 
Maybe we could have a role of like a project archivist, a person who's basically their job is to kind of like look over the shoulder of the developers and start to go and like ask them questions like, well, why did you do that? What's going on with this? And record all this stuff and make it indexable so that we have a, a real legitimate project history of something. So that if one of those people leaves, you're able to go and recover things and start to go and get a sense of the design thoughts that informed that particular piece of uh, system that you're working on. So I think that's something we can actually think about a bit. So this is a, if we get diminishing returns from having developers, then there's other roles we can do. But we, we haven't really gone in that direction very much. So much of what we've been doing over the past 10, 15 years has been getting everybody to be able to do everything, pretty much. And I see this over and over again in the Agile realm. Um, and, you know, it's good. It's nice to be multi-capable as people, and that's good. But people have their preferences also. Some people might like to do some things rather than others. So, yeah, so going back to, like, the Spotify model and things like this, you know, there's this interesting thing that we try to have this cross-cutting stuff. You have your tribes, um, you have chapters, you have guilds, and a lot of this stuff, you know, these cross-cutting things that cut across squads, a lot of this is to go and basically deal with the issues of scale, right? If you had an organization that's organized only around squads, didn't have guilds or chapters, there'd be a lot of information that would never be communicated across the organization. So this is why we go and we do this sort of thing. And this is not a new idea. This is something which comes from, like, um, in management and organizational theory, it was called matrixing. Like, they have the matrix organization. So the thing is that we're trying to deal in scale by going and sort of cross-cutting these things. But it's worth going and saying, gee, maybe there's other things we can do in conjunction with this. Um, anybody ever hear of this guy at all? Bruno Latour? French sociologist, and he studied how science is done. And one of the things that he was really kind of digging into um, was this kind of radical at the time idea um, that he outlined in this book called Reassembling the Social, that what we can do is we can diagram out systems um, where we basically go and show the interactions not just between the people, but also the things that we are working on, right? So the things themselves have certain qualities which are basically useful for us to go and understand. And you'll see in this picture here, we talk about like, you know, a car, a bike, a home, a university, a professor, books, roads. You can see forces between these things. And when you do, then you have more of a, a better picture of things. If we go back here, it's like, you know, where's the code in this diagram? Where are your microservices? Right? Isn't it kind of weird that we basically sort of like, even knowing Conway's law, we're going to go and basically sort of like just chop the system in half and look only at the people organization and not look at the architecture at the same time? You know, I think we're really in, poised now to go and actually sort of like find better ways of doing this. Um, Mythical Man Month, adding people to a late project makes it later. That's another of those dynamics I mentioned a bit earlier. Let's go back to this thing I was showing earlier, the testing application, right? In the center of this group. Um, and we saw the ugly code that we saw in the center. And I asked, I said, you know, what are the things that we can go and do to go and solve this problem? And I said, well, let's wait. Let's look at the forces. Well, you know, it turns out that what actually happened in this situation was that I think two of the teams basically took the code that was in the center and ended up incorporating it into their project. So it was going to be duplicated code, but they felt it was not worth the thing of going and actually having to sort of like synchronize against that code base. So they basically pulled it into their stuff, whereas the other three said, let's develop a plug-in architecture for that framework so we can go and make our decisions, make our, um, our changes with a little bit more discipline than just going and adding things to a base class. So there are all these different ways that we can approach these things, many solutions. We could do the other things. Somebody mentioned having a separate team that goes and just like deals with that testing app. But the thing is, all these things have trade-offs, and the trade-offs are based upon particular forces of how code and people interact, okay? Code, people, tools, and the system. Um, so yeah, we have all these choices. One of the things I keep coming back to, and I've been trying to sort of like suss this out and try to go and expand it as more of a theory in a way, is that it seems like the most valuable thing that we have is the connection between a code base and a group of people working on it, right? If you know who Jessica Kerr is, like Jessica Tron, she's written about something uh, um, an idea from Nora Bateson called Samathacy, where basically you see, you see organizations as living systems, and it's not just the people, it's also the tools they use and the code and the environment and stuff like that. It's a pretty cool word, nobody can spell it, you know, it's kind of a long word, but I would love to find a word for just the code and team aspect of this. And the reason why is because this central thing, 
is so important to what we do. Um, if you think about, like, say, what legacy code is, right? Legacy code is this thing where basically you wrote a lot of code, people go away, and then new people come onto the team. And when new people come onto the team, it's kind of like, well, there's a disconnect there. They don't have all the history. The history came from working in the code. And the knowledge that the people that left had has gone away. And it's really kind of hard to transfer that knowledge across people. It's more like you do the work together, and as you do the work together, then you have that knowledge. But I've seen people do silly, silly things in the industry. I remember going into, um, there was one place in Europe I went to years ago, and I came in and I was called in to go and help them with refactoring. I said, please explain the code base to me. And they said, well, we can't. We just saw it last week. You know, essentially this code base was shipped over to them from another country with nobody going and giving them any guidance about how it worked. And they said, they were told, go and make changes in this code base. You know, that, that's an extreme case, but it's kind of like, how do, you, how do we even expect that to work, right? When all the history has been lost in the code base that you're working on. So, you know, there's the code and the team, and essentially when we break them apart, things end up getting kind of crazy. Um, and it's like there's this shearing thing that I think is worth discussing, not just in this space, but it's also in others, right? I mentioned the legacy code thing a few minutes ago. But like um, QA and development, if you have a QA organization and you have development, this thing of going and separating the functions causes this thing where basically you have like a little bit of lead time to get things into QA and stuff like this. You know, when we break things apart that are usually together, then we end up introducing tension into a system. And then what do we do when we have this tension in systems? We introduce props. We introduce things like, remember the component team and feature team? I said, you know, we introduce the component guardian that becomes the person you go through to get your changes in the code base. And that's a process thing that's basically placed there to go and overcome a problem that we introduced ourselves to go and solve a problem. So I always have this thing, it's like when you introduce a corrective for a solution, then maybe you should go back and ask what the original problem was, right? Kind of a funny thing. So props, I think, are kind of important. I still haven't elucidated what these really are in software development very much. You know, um, it's a very scary picture, isn't it? A building being propped up. Wouldn't want to be underneath that. Here's one which is nicer. Tree, you know, yeah. Chances are you can run out of the way very quickly if the tree goes and falls over. But I think that we should have fewer props in software development. And at least we should be aware of when we are using one um, process or organizational structure to prop up forces that are caused by introducing the original structure. And with this, I mean, still, we're probably gonna have props for things because scaling is one of those things where you introduce tension in a system. But we should be very conscious of it. And if we're not conscious of it, then we might not see some of the other opportunities. So I'm gonna tell you one other story. Um, some people I was working with recently, and it was kind of a funny thing. As I'm talking about this whole thing where code and team tend to kind of like interact in a way. Um, you can see here these two boxes at the bottom What's going on here is that basically in each of these we had a team. Those are two teams there. But it's not just a team, it's code also, right? Inside of each of, each of those boxes you have people working on front end and back end code. And they were working together. So you'd have two components both consisting of front end and back end code. Also had this other team that wanted to go and basically use the interface from the back end, okay, in order to go and do their work. They had an API that the back end in the back end that was used by the front end. And um, they wanted to use that, but they had trouble. And the reason why was because in those teams, that interface wasn't all that nice because you had the same people working on both sides of it. It's like, you're, you know, I'm on the front end today and I was on the back end yesterday. I need an interface between these things. There's no real tension to go and make that interface better. And if you know Conway's Law, you might say, well, maybe with Conway's Law, if you had separate teams working on this, that's a good way to go and develop a good API because you're going to negotiate it as separate teams, right? So the interface between these two things wasn't all that nice. And um, this third team was trying to go and use the backend API. And, um, you know, it seems like a reasonable thing to do, but it was kind of muddy. And the reason why is because we didn't have that thing. And um, it's, it's funny about this too because there's so many different ways of looking at this. You can look at it in the context of, of Conway's Law. Another way you can look at it as well is to kind of recognize that, you know, it's like we have this thing, this interface between front end and back end, but since we don't have team boundaries there at all, we're actually almost like violating encapsulation in a way. You have an external team that's basically trying to use your internal stuff that's never been published as an external API, 
right? So you can kind of see the forces involved in doing this a bit. Right, that's the kind of seeing I want us to go and kind of get to in the industry. So that, you know, this was presented to me as a situation that happened where like, oh, okay, this thing started to fall apart and we have this problem. How do we go and reorganize things? But my guess is you should be able to look at this ahead of time and say, well, gee, if we organize ourselves this way, these are the things we're going to have to deal with. And maybe you introduce props to go and deal with these things or you find a better way of organizing yourself so that you don't have those same issues. So, yeah, um, I guess one of the things that, just to go and reiterate, is like how much load can we handle as an organization? Um, the thing that I find fascinating is that as we create these cross-cutting groupings that we have, we introduce the number of points of contact we have in organizations, and that's good. I think Spotify model and the things that are variants of it can work um, for a good medium-sized organization. I kind of wonder as things get way big, we probably have to do different scaling things than that. Um, yeah, um, I just want to go and sort of like, yeah, just end up and go and say that there's, there's a thing about this which I think is kind of important to get where we get across. I'm going to reiterate what I said a little bit earlier. These are natural forces. These are not like, we don't get to go and sort of like say, I'm going to design a process where 100 people get to work together day in. They get to work together in close concert every day and it's going to work out fine, right? There are certain limits, you know, that we have as people. And there are certain limits we have in architecture. You know, all of the things that we do for modularity in code are to basically go and make things small enough for us to understand the pieces one at a time, right? So um, I think the deep thing to get with this is that, is that these are the same forces. It's all about going and reducing cognitive load on things. And also going in, when you reduce cognitive load and you introduce these pieces, how do you go and get them to interact in ways so you can go and serve the bigger structure? And the bigger structure is this machine that we have for going and developing software. And... Uh, participating in a business. So I kind of want to just basically leave it there and um, I just kind of open it up to um, any questions that you might have for this. So thank you. Okay, so I have one question here. Do you have any advice on making management acknowledge trade-offs, independence versus waste, autonomy versus standardization, instead of just focusing on costs. Um, I think the one thing I'll say about this is that this is another case of that shearing that happens. Okay? Essentially, when you have, um, within an organization, we have pressure towards, um, pressure towards going and sort of uh, keeping costs within bounds because of the way that we participate in the market and share price for public companies and stuff like this. So there's a lot of short-term thinking that happens along with those things. Um, I think anything that you can do that basically goes and introduces more of a durational view within the organization is a, is a decent thing with that. But I don't have anything which is really direct about, about that particular thing. Um, other questions? Comments? Okay, well, thank you very much. Yeah.